welcome to this uh, session dedicated to the contemporary adoption of invasive coronary physiology with microcatheter based uh, technology at gym meeting. Let me start uh, thanking the uh, sponsor of this session, Inside Life Tech and Yukon, who made possible to uh, get an excellent panel of uh, experts discussing about this topic. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over the word to my co-chairman, Eugenio Colaiori. Eugenio, please. Thank you. Good morning, Emanuele. The title of our symposium is Contemporary Adoption of Invasive Coronary Physiology with the Microcatheter-Based Technology. We have to say that in the last 10 years, the field is rapidly evolving, moving from pressure wire physiology and need of adenosine to physiology with no need of adenosine, and more recently, to FFR derived from conventional angiography, namely QFR, or derived from coronary CT. So it seems that uh, we made a step back with guidewire and microcatheter again. We have to say that FFR derived from conventional angiography or from CT have shown to be a promising tool. However, we have to realize the accuracy of these methods remain lower compared to invasive functional assessment. In other words, invasive physiological evaluation remain the gold standard to assess lesion significance of epicardial stenosis. As you also know, invasive functional evaluation can be done using either pressure wire or microcatheter. So, you should attend this session if you want to understand the role of a microcatheter based physiology, also through a critical appraisal of available literature. If you want to know how to correct adopt the novel through physio microcatheter, and finally, to discuss the importance of a physiological assessment to plan and optimize treatment to assess its results, underlying the added value of microcatheter-based physiology. So let's move to the agenda. Lecture number one is entitled Wire-Based versus Microcatheter-Based FFR Measurement, Strength and Drawback, and it will be held by Luigi Di Serafino. Then we have a love in the box, performed by Emanuele Barbato and team in Alst. And finally, we have the lecture number two, Microcatheter-Based FFR, to plan and optimize PCI and to assess functional results, held by Simone Biscaglia. So, without losing any time, let's give the floor to uh, Luigi Di Serafino, which is interventional cardiology at the University Hospital of Naples. So, please, Luigi. Thank you, Eugenio, for uh, your kind uh, presentation. And uh, uh, thanks to the organization for this kind of invitation. So we all know what uh, FFR is and uh, how it has changed our current clinical practice in the field of the interventional cardiology. Basically, the FFR is the ratio between the maximum achievable blood flow in a stenotic vessel to the theoretical maximum flow in the same vessel in the hypothetical absence of any stenosis. We also know that only during uh, maximum hyperemia, uh, a ratio between flows can be simplified as a ratio between two pressures, namely the distal pressure, which is uh, actually measured by the pressure wire of the pressure microcatheter, and the proximal pressure, which is uh, actually measured by the guiding catheter. There is uh, a large amount of evidence supporting the use of uh, FFR in uh, the current clinical practice. First, we know that deferring PCI of uh, intermediate stenosis on the basis of a negative FFR value is safe, even at very long-term follow-up, as demonstrated by the DEFER trial. In the FAME trial, the FFR-guided PCI of patients with multivessel disease is associated with a better clinical outcome as compared with the angio-guided PCI. And much more interestingly, uh, the FFR-guided PCI of functionally significant uh, lesions uh, improved the outcome and better uh, as compared with the medical therapy alone. 
Uh, more recently, with the intention to validate uh, the uh, IFR, a, um, an hyperemic, uh, a non hyperemic uh, tool for the management of patients with multivested disease, uh, 4,000, more than 4,000 patients have been uh, included in uh, the Define Flare and Sweetheart confirming the role of physiology-guided revascularization procedures. For these reasons, um, the current European guidelines for the diagnosis and management of uh, chronic coronary syndromes largely support the use of FFR and non hyperemic indexes to evaluate uh, intermediate stenosis, particularly in patients presenting with multivested disease, unless presenting with uh, critical, very critical stenosis. However, the penetration of uh, the FFR and IFR, so these functional measurements uh, uh, in Europe is extremely low, uh, particularly in Italy. So why a microcatheter-based uh, FFR? First of all, because uh, after adenosine administration, wire manipulation is one of the reasons why FFR adoption remains underused worldwide. Although with significant improvement of materials and techniques, a pressure wire will never be comparable to a regular workhorse wire. In addition, there are some unmet clinical needs which need to be addressed and probably the pressure wire does not uh, uh, facilitate this progress. These are represent some um, differences between uh, the true physio microcatheter um, as compared with the other uh, conventional pressure wires. First of all, the microcatheter can go through uh, a conventional and um, more used workhorse wire. Uh, in addition, while the pressure sensor is uh, uh, placed in a fixed position, uh, uh, mostly at 30 millimeters from the distal tip of the pressure wire, this is not the case for the microcatheter. Of course, the pressure sensor is uh, fixed on the microcatheter, but uh, the distance uh, of this pressure from the distal tip is uh, incredibly uh, short, two millimeters and a half. And this is important because it allows to measure um, uh, not only distal lesions, but even more proximal lesions when some operators have uh, some difficulties to um, go through particularly tortuous vessels. And most of them uh, usually um, are used to um, frequently disconnect and reconnect the cable from the pressure wires. And this increased the risk of uh, uh, pressure wire damage and uh, the risk, of course, of finding a, a, a significant drift at the end of the measurement. So you are obliged to perform the measurement again. These are two case examples uh, um, demonstrating uh, um, the cases where even the much, uh, even the, uh, the operators uh, extremely um, uh, friend, in, extremely confident with the pressure wire management would rather prefer to, to, to use a regular uh, guide wire. And uh, honestly, the, the case on right coronary artery uh, represents a case where even performing the angiography would result in a, a, different, a difficult job. Um, another point of discussion is uh, represented by the equalization, which is actually a, a simple step, but it can be um, sometimes even more difficult than usual, particularly when facing with difficult uh, anatomies. Uh, for example, in case of uh, uh, osseal stenosis, just uh, uh, here represented with the, in the, of the right coronary artery, in this case, we cannot go through um, the vessel with the pressure wire um, as distal as possible before the equalization. So this case, in this case, we have to perform the equalization with the wire just a little bit placed in the in the proximal part or um, or, or the vessel. So uh, in this 
makes the system extremely, uh, extremely unstable. So in the majority of the cases, the best solution would be to perform the equalization with both the guiding catheter and the pressure wire placed freely in the aorta, in the ascending aorta. Um, of course, this situation uh, does not occur if you are using a microcatheter. In this case, you already have the pressure, the, the wire, the regular wire, the workhorse wire, placed as distal as possible in the, um, uh, in, along the vessel. So uh, you can take the, the, um, uh, the, the guiding catheter out of the ostium without any fear to lose the entire system. And then you can perform the equalization with the microcatheter in, a, a, an, easy, uh, in an easy way. Um, another point of discussion would be uh, the pullback maneuver. Sometimes we face with uh, um, serial stenosis. And in this case, in order to um, evaluate uh, uh, which one has to be treated, uh, so the one with the largest pressure gradient, uh, we have to uh, perform the pullback maneuver in order to uh, get the precise, in order to uh, focalize our attention on the on the functional, the more functionally significant stenosis. Just go back to the previous example. So in this case, this measurement would result in a difficult job. In fact, uh, for two things. The first thing is that uh, we are obliged to uh, pull back the wire uh, in order to get the maximum gradient along the two regions. Uh, and then, in this, in this way, we lose the access to our artery, unless we don't use a second wire as a body wire. Uh, in addition, and much more importantly, uh, while you are performing the pullback maneuver, you have to make, uh, uh, keep great attention to the, to the to pressure tracings, because sometimes the guiding catheter is, um, can be attracted by the ostium, and uh, um, a pressure damping would result. This pressure damping um, could even mask the pressure gradient. And uh, of course, uh, we can lose the, uh, the right position of the wire, so the right position of the pressure gradient, and uh, we can underestimate the ischemic potential of the lesions we are measuring. In addition, some operators know this, uh, uh, this, this, this problem, and they try to keep the, cutter, the guiding cutter outside of the ostium as, uh, as long as possible, but sometimes the, the, the tension is um, too much and the system can jump it out, can jump out. So this means that we, uh, are facing with an anatomic situation which uh, uh, allows to uh, underestimate uh, the ischemic potential lesions that we are we are measuring this is this does not occur with the microcatheter in this case indeed we have uh, the wire already placed distally into the vessel and uh, we can just uh, measure the uh, functional significance of both the region just just pulling back the microcatheter and not the wire. So you will always have the access to the vessel and you don't have to be afraid to lose your system. Uh, another point of discussion uh, would be the rewiring uh, for post-PCI assessment. This topic will be further and better um, uh, presented by Simone in a few minutes. So these are the, both the console, the vibrocardio system, uh, which represents um, the um, interface between us, the operators, and the pressure signals. And on the right, the true physiological exchange pressure microcatheter. So this microcatheter works like a, 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 a regular balloon. Um, it can go through every regular workhorse wire. It has a really ultra thin profile with um, a dimension less than 1.6 French. It has been made for uh, saving both time and contrast, particularly for complex PCI. It has been designed particularly for um, uh, keep the procedure of pulling back or pull back more safer and uh, for the assessment also for uh, the function result in a post-PCI um, session. So this is uh, the true 
uh, physio microcatheter in one piece with its uh, own uh, um, cable. And uh, uh, here on the right, we have the distal part, uh, which is uh, actually a, a, a very uh, interesting part. Um, it has a very small uh, profile, uh, and the sensor area is uh, really short, uh, five millimeter. And uh, the distance uh, between the distal tip and the pressure sensor is uh, really short, two millimeter and a half. In, in addition, there are um, two markers. So the pressure sensor is located in between two radio opaque markers uh, with three millimeters of distance, uh, which allow for sensor location and why not the lesion length estimation. So the true physio microcatheter uh, comes in one piece together with this cable. So we don't have to connect and disconnect the, the wire or the microcatheter because you already cross the lesions. You just have to measure it. This is uh, um, the SUPREME study, which has already been presented uh, as late clinical trial, breaking trial a few months ago. It's a comparison between FFR assessment performed with uh, uh, the Abbott pressure wire and the microcatheter, uh, the true physio microcatheter. And it um, has been showed a, a very good accuracy of these uh, uh, FFR values obtained by the microcatheter as compared with the, FF, the pressure wire together with uh, um, a very nice, good correlation between the two, the two values. Uh, in addition, um, there was no significant difference in terms of drift magnitude between the two, uh, the two tools. However, the rate of clinically significant drift was significantly lower with the FFR microcatheter uh, as compared with the pressure wire based FFR. So why a microcatheter based FFR? In the pre-PCI evaluation, it allows to assess the scanning potential of evocal stenosis and to decide on the management. And it allows to use any workhorse wire, saving time, contrast, reducing drift, especially in challenging anatomy. During PCI, there is no need of changing wire since the workhorse wire is already in place, thereby it facilitates PCI procedures. In the post-PCI assessment, uh, it allows to maintain the guide wire position distal in the vessel while we are uh, functionally assessing our results. So basically, microcatheter-based coronary physiology simplifies invasive functional assessment, and it might further improve the adoption of physiology, both to indicate and to guide PCI. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Luigi, for this very nice uh, presentation. Um, let me start uh, uh, the discussion by asking whether there are uh, questions from uh, the other colleagues, uh, from Simone, from Eugenio. Yes, Emanuele, I actually have a question. So, Luigi, you made nice examples of using uh, microcatheter in, in complex cases. So, can you tell us uh, tell us something about the performance of true physio, in, like calcified lesion, in terms of uh, crossing profile, pushability, and so on? Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Simone. Uh, this is an interesting question. Actually, I have been uh, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, use this uh, uh, microcatheter a few times, and uh, it was. Uh, uh, impressive because it um, it um, it uh, it seems uh, like uh, a regular uh, balloon a CTO balloon, and um, it works uh, really uh, easily. And it goes really smooth through the uh, Pacific vessel. But uh, what was really uh, impressive is uh, the fact that uh, you don't have to be afraid to cross. Uh, with, uh, with your pressure wire, um, tortoise vessels, you already have the wire, you just have to measure, and you can reach the very distal part of the vessel in um, like an easy job. So it's, it's impressive. Luigi, do I understand well that the crossing profile of this balloon is favorable? I mean, it's not like a, uh, you know, a bulky microcatheter. Is that right? Yes, yes. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nice, uh, it has a very low profile. It can, it can go smoothly and um, it's really impressive. I mean, uh, it was, a, it was a, a nice experience. 
Eugenio, any other question from your side? Perhaps you, sh you should open the microphone, Eugenio. Luigi, uh, a practical question. Uh, if I have a vessel with two serial stenosis and I have to put my sensor of the conventional FFR wire more detail I can, honestly, I cannot do normally. Uh, do you think we can overcome this issue with true physio? Yes, indeed. The fact that uh, um, true physio has the sensor positioned in, uh, in the very distal part, uh, just uh, really close to the distal tip. And uh, this allows not only to measure very distal lesions, but even allows us to measure even proximal lesion if the wire does not cross uh, the entire vessel because uh, uh, the extremity, the, 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 the extreme uh, tortuous anatomy. So it, uh, um, this prevents from the occurrence of spasm and uh, of course it simplifies our measurements. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we, we are uh, quite uh, well set in terms of timing and uh, we can move on to the uh, live in the box or recorded case. Um, I will hand over now the word to Emanuele Gallinoro, who's uh, introducing the case. Emanuele, please. Thank you, Emanuele. I will present the case. So the case I'm going to present has been recorded in the cardiovascular center in Aast, Belgium. The patient is a 72 year old lady with diabetes, dyslipidemia and obesity. She had recently an inferior STEMI in December, 2020. Uh, the culprit lesion was located in the proximal right, as you can see from the left coronary angiogram. And on the right, you can see the final result after the implantation of a 323 uh, stent. But this was a case of a multivessel disease. Uh, indeed, here we see that there is a moderate stenosis in the mid LAD and a mild to moderate stenosis in the distal circumflex and in the first marginal branch. So um, our plan was to uh, perform a physiology uh, guided PCI, so to evaluate the uh, hemodynamic impact of this stenosis and also uh, to uh, perform a post-PCI physiological assessment. Do you want to go on, Emanuele? Uh, thank you very much. Um, and that's the way it starts, uh, as usually. Um, uh, there is a calibration phase uh, where we make the console, the vivo cardio console, uh, speaking the same language of the MECLAB console. So once the aortic pressure is calibrated, we open up the uh, fluid fill uh, connector and we get a synchronous measurement of the aortic pressure. As we usually do after a primary PCI, this patient was uh, taken back to the cat lab a couple of days later. Uh, we check the uh, patency of the stent recently implanted in the culprit vessel. And as you can see, uh, the vessel was fine. The flow was fine as well in the, in the right coronary artery. Let me take also this opportunity to thank um, uh, Katia van Kutzen and Eddie who were the nurses helping us during this uh, uh, recording. Now, this is the right coronary artery. You will see now the left coronary artery. The quality is a bit better as the one seen in the slides. And you can appreciate these uh, uh, intermediate stenosis in the mid circumflex and in the first margin branch. Um, now we move to a cranial view where you see this long lesion in the in the mid LED, it's actually a little bit longer if you pay attention uh, than what we see on the angiogram. The disease starts even earlier than the first diagonal branch. Let's see in this uh, angiogram. So the disease starts before the diagonal branch and goes uh, way beyond the ostium of this uh, of this side branch. In this specific moment, we took uh, as a guiding catheter uh, an EBU6 French. We are transradial right in terms of vascular axis. And this is again another projection that makes you better understanding the anatomy of this uh, LAD lesion. There we go. Good, Eugenio. Thank you. 
Ok, let's do a quick round of opinion. Ferrara and then Naples. How would you manage this patient, Simone? So for the non-culprit lesion, I would have tried to acquire a projection for an angio-based FFR reconstruction during primary PCI, and then I would have tried to perform the analysis uh, offline after the procedure, and then if positive, uh, uh, took back the patient in the cath lab. Okay, Luigi? Yes, this is a nice, uh, a nice case example uh, uh, how the, the things goes in the cath lab. This is uh, uh, interesting. I, um, I, I, I seen that uh, your your first uh, injection was on the contralateral uh, vessel uh, in respect of the the stem. So you performed before the angio of the non carpet uh, uh, vessel and uh, then the card the, the the PCI. Or the carpal lesion. This is how exactly uh, perform also the, um, the the primary PCI in my current clinical practice. Uh, actually, I would have uh, um, performed the FFR um, in the active setting. This is a uh, uh, this is what I have been. Um, this is what I I would have done in this in this case uh, because of the risk of finding, of course. Uh, uh, non-significant uh, lesion uh, and then the, the risk of uh, taking back the, the patient on the table uh, again a few days later. Thank you, Luigi. So I think we can uh, go back again to Alst. So please, Emmanuel. Yes. Thank you very much. So, um, what we did in this case, we took the patient back, as we said before, and we started the functional evaluation of the uh, circumflex. Uh, what is the advantage of the true fission microcatheter? You use the guide wire you want. We used, in this case, a BNW wire that we position in the circ. We are now ready to take the microcatheter. What we do to start with, we unpack the device. We flush with saline, pure saline, the plastic hose that contains the microcatheter. And then we connect the microcatheter to the console, as you see uh, uh, done in this moment. There we go. On the display of the console, there will be popping up this zero PD. All what we have to do is to push on that. And we are now ready to introduce the microcatheter within the guiding catheter. You know, it has a, a short monorail that you can appreciate now that I'm loading the microcatheter on the guide wire. Let's follow this uh, step. You know, it's a very tiny microcatheter. As Luigi was alluding to uh, before during the presentation, um, this is really a good profile. It's so thin that nearly mimics the tip of a guide wire. And that is why I suspect this microcatheter can really advance and slide everywhere without any kind of problems. Now you will see the guide wire coming out of the short monorail, just to give you an idea of the monorail uh, segment length. And now we introduce the uh, microcatheter within the guiding catheter, much like we would do with any kind of monorail balloon. You know, once we are with the, with the tip of the microcatheter at the level of the uh, uh, tip of the guiding catheter, you can clearly see where the tip of the microcatheter is because we have these two radio peak markers and the pressure sensor is just in between these two microcatheter. It is the moment to flush the system. So what I like to do on my manifold is to take out the uh, syringe with contrast, take a new syringe and flush the whole system in order to make sure that there is no residual of contrast within the guiding catheter that can dampen the pressure tracing. At this very moment, I perform the equalization by simply pushing on that button. The two pressure, the RT pressure and the pressure measured by the microcatheter are perfectly superimposed. At this moment, we are ready to advance the microcatheter. All what we have to do, because we already have in mind the localization of the stenosis, we have to advance the microcatheter and induce hyperemia. Now, in our case, we use intracoronary papaverin. And you know, papaverin and contrast do not really go well along. So if you have to inject papaverin, you have to make sure that contrast is 
flushed, flushed away. And that's what we did from the beginning. Now we start recording and we inject the bolus of papaverin. You see, that's the advantage of combining microcatheter with papaverin because we don't have to use again contrast when navigating the pressure wire within the coronary artery. The guide wire is there. All what we have to do is to push the microcatheter distal. This is the Sorry. FFR. Yes, please. Sorry, Manuele, just a quick question. After papaverin, do you flush with saline or just uh, you inject papaverin and you wait? No, no, we flush with saline. As you notice, Simone, I injected 3cc within the um, dead space of the guiding catheter. And when you saw me injecting with saline, it was just pushing forward the papaverin that was already in the dead space of the, of the guiding catheter. So it's, it's in a way, yes, uh, to, to give you an answer. So there we go. This is the assessment of the circumflex, 0.92. At this moment, uh, all what we have to do is to uh, pull back the, uh, the guide wire and go to the marginal branch. Now, we record the first measurement, 0.9, as we saw on the, uh, on the console of the microcatheter. Now, we move on. At this moment, I lead contrast, and I ask to Emanuele to inject some contrast because I'm navigating the wire, repositioning it. But that is the only moment I give contrast. Once the guide wire is in place, I already know where the pressure sensor should be located in order to assess that particular vision. So again, the two markers at the tip of the guiding catheter, let's remember the sensor is located between the two markers. We check again the equalization. There we go. I already flushed with saline. Uh, in the interest of time, it's cut from this video. I advance the microcatheter. Okay, this is the resting PDPA. And there we go again. Papaverin in the dead space of the catheter. I ask to the nurse to push on rec. There we go. Now we are recording. I wait a few seconds to have resting PDPA recorded, 0.98, 97. Open the stopcock, inject saline, pushing forward the papaverin that is already in the dead space of the, of the guiding catheter. And now we, we observe now the hyperemic response. Please notice also the time of each measurement. Less than one minute, actually, the first one. The second one, we pull back, we check the equalization, we, we check actually if the two pressures are going back to one, and then we stop recording. So this was also not significant. Now, what you see here, 0.73, that's actually an error that the system does in detecting the maximum pressure gradient between the aortic pressure and the microcatheter pressure that we can correct afterward in data archiving, but I'll share this with you at the end of the session. Now, the second lesion is also non-significant. We reorient the guide wire towards the LAD. We change projection as we all do in our uh, daily practice, and we advance the guide wire to the LAD. Very safely, always with the same BNW wire. Cranial view, again, the microcatheter at the tip of the guiding catheter, we reconnect papaverin at the stopcock. We take another syringe with saline that we connect at the other uh, stopcock of the manifold. That's what I'm asking to Emanuele. There we go. We make sure that the contrast that is in the guiding catheter is completely flushed away. So a couple of, you can also see that the, um, the, the composition of the syringe with papaverin is different, the density from the composition and the density of the saline. Now the system is ready. We check the equalization again. Eddie, our nurse pushes on equalize, but you see it's always one. Eh? We, we just do it in the interest of education. So PDPA is one, equalization is correct. Then we advance the microcatheter into the distal LED. I know exactly where the stenosis is as I use the radio peak part of the guide wire as the landing zone, if I may say so. Now we are distal. At this point, I ask 
to record the pressure tracings. You will see that shortly the record button will turn uh, to uh, rec. There we go. And now we inject a power in, in the dead space. Actually, it's at this very moment that I push on record. There we go, in order to have a clean measurement from the beginning till the end. Now we are recording. That's the resting PDP 0.86, 0.87, 88, okay. And you saw now that the Arctic pressure is just interrupted shortly because I injected papaverin, and now we see the epidemic response. It's going down, 084, 83, 81, 79. And I guess the lowest value will be around 77, 78. But you see there is a significant hyperemic gradient. There we go. We stop recording and what you see, it's a snapshot. Yeah, the lowest value is 76. You will see a snapshot that the system recognizes as maximum pressure gradient. Of course, I do the pullback also to see where most of the epidemic gradient is located. We stop recording, equalization is more or less okay. Voila, it gives you 0.63. Again, it's the usual trick that I mentioned before that the system detects capture the maximum pressure gradient. That doesn't mean that is the correct FFR, but in the data archiving phase, we will demonstrate how to pick the correct uh, pressure gradient also for uh, future recordings. Eugenio. Perfect, thank you, Emanuele. I'm now curious to, to know how in Italy we induce hyperemia. So uh, please, Luigi, which drug do you use and then Simone? Well, actually, we currently use adenosine most of the time, adenosine, even uh, adenosine IV. IV, perfect. Simone? Adenosine IV also. We are Thank on you. all the cases. Yes. Thank you. So, please, um, if we have uh, some questions for Emanuele, we can start from Luigi. Yes, uh, Emanuele, thank you for sharing this uh, uh, nice example of a patient with multivested disease and several lesions uh, everywhere, I must say. Um, uh, I was wondering why you did not uh, uh, measure the FFR in the first diagonal branch? Uh, that's, uh, that's a good point, Luigi. Actually, um, physiology in bifurcation lesion has been investigated, but not um, um, in the sense of truly guiding PCI of a bifurcation lesion. So in other words, if you measure FFR in the LAD and in the diagonal branch, that is not predicting what will happen in terms of functional significance to the diagonal branch all the way through the PCI. In other words, if I extend the main branch and I have a, a significant plug shift towards the diagonal branch, FFR pre at baseline does not predict what will be and whether there will be a significant plug shift. So rather than investing time in measuring FFR into the diagonal branch at the beginning, it's much more useful to do it just at the end. Thank you. The PCI. Perfect. Simone? Yes, I have a, a very practical question. You almost uh, already said it, but uh, is there any difference in terms of protocol uh, of uh, FFR performance with the microcatheter rather than the conventional pressure wire? or it's the same actually? Well, that's a, that's a very important point, Simone. Uh, we should try to always have a standardized protocol when doing uh, invasive physiology. Always we have to be consistent, repeating always the same step. And as you saw throughout the procedure, we roughly did the same steps as we would do with the pressure wire protocol. So correct equalization, flushing the uh, contrast out to avoid dampening of pressure uh, and inducing hyperemia pulling back, checking whether there is any focal versus diffuse disease, disease gradient, but you will discuss this later, and check always whether the uh, two pressures, whether the equalization is correct at the end. So in a nutshell, it's exactly the same protocol as compared to a pressure wire-based physiology. Thank you, Manuele. Now I'm curious because in Italy, we use adeno-IV. You used papaverin. So my question is, how long hyperemia lasts with papaverin? And uh, how is the methodology to use papaverin? That's a, that's a very important practical question, Eugenio. Uh, papaverin ha has the advantage of having a longer um, half-life as compared to adenosine. 
and the hyperemic response of papaverin IC is longer as compared to the hyperemic response of adenosine IC. So just to give you a magnitude of uh, um, uh, reference, with adenosine IC, the maximum hyperemic response lasts between 50 to 20 seconds. With papaverin IC, it can go up to one minute. What does that mean practically? It means that you can perform nice pullback curves even during the maximal hyperemic response. With adenosine intracoronary, that's not possible because by the time you get the maximal hyperemic response, you don't have the time to do careful pullback. And second advantage as compared to adenosine ID is that you don't have to wait two to three minutes to achieve a maximal hyperemic response as it is the case in the IV infusion. Thank you, thank you, Manuela. Let's go for a last question for you, Simone, please. Yes, uh, another practical question, actually, because when you perform FFR pullback, you have to go through the vessel at least twice or thrice. And then uh, every time you're not sh so sure that you are in the same position as before and, uh, if, and that you can interpret the pullback in the same way. So do you think this uh, can be different with the microcatheter? Is this a meaningful, meaningful difference or not, or not in your opinion? Uh, that's, a, that's a major difference between a pressure wire based physiology and a microcatheter based physiology. As I tried to demonstrate before during the case, you place your guide wire, your workhorse guide wire, in a certain point in the vessel, and you have the radiopaque tip of the guide wire as a reference. You know that depending on the guide wire, it's two to three centimeters long, this radiopaque tip. So if you decide that your starting point of the radiopaque part of the tip is your landing zone, then you can be consistent that that landing zone will remain the same all the way through the assessment in the case. With pressure wire, how we do it currently, and you are experts so you know better than I do, you have always to check with contrast. You, you take an angiographic landmark, a side branch, a diagonal or a septal branch, you position the pressure sensor there, and you keep in mind that it has always to be there. So each time you go in and out with your pressure wire, you have to give repetitive bolus of contrast. That's a major difference between the two systems. Thank you, Emanuele. Luigi, do you have a last question for Emanuele? Yes, uh, thank you, Eugenio. Well, it was impressive how the, um, the drift uh, was always less than uh, three units uh, in all your measurements. Uh, do you think this might be related to the fact that you don't have to manipulate too much uh, a pressure wire, but just to have to push the microcatheter forward? What do you think? That's, uh, that's certainly one of the reasons, Luigi. What I would also add to this one is that the system is more stable and clean. With that, what I mean, contrast, the presence of contrast on the pressure sensor itself is one of the reasons for drift. The fact that the system is cleaned with saline from the beginning of the recording till the end of the pullback uh, makes you taking out one of the possible factors to drift in addition to the technology, of course, that the, this men's technology that the microcatheter has make the signal very stable, I must say. I, I never happen to really see a major drift, honestly, with this device. Thank you, Manuela. I think it's time to go to us again to see the procedure. Yes, here we go. Okay, so uh, basically then for the PCI, uh, we place two wires, uh, two BMW, one in the LAD and the second one in the first diagonal branch. Then we use the a semi compliant balloon at 2.515 for the pay dilation of the lesion. Uh, the balloon was inflated up to 10 atmospheres in order to achieve a good lesion preparation. And then the stent was advanced quite easily through the lesion. The, the stent is a 2.75, 33 millimeters. We placed it uh, carefully in order not to leave any uh, residual plaque uh, at the proximal or at the distal edge of the stent. So we placed it carefully under uh, fluoroscopy. And then the stent was deployed and the balloon was inflated up to 14 atmospheres.
then we retrieved the balloon of the stand and we performed a pot, a proximal optimization of the stand expansion with a non-compliant balloon at 312. Also, in order to uh, facilitate afterwards the, the wire exchange. So this non-compliant balloon was inflated up to 14 atmospheres. Then this is the, uh, the result. Then we performed the wire exchange. So basically the wire from the LED was retrieved. The tip was kept in the, in the stand and we crossed the stand struts in order to place this wire in the diagonal. And here we go. And then now we have the wire that was previously placed in the first diagonal that of course is jailed. So then we pull back the gel, the gelled wire from the first diagonal carefully because we always have this movement that the guiding catheter tends to go deep in the uh, coronary artery. And then we place this wire in the distal LED. So after the wire exchange, we perform the kissing with the semi-compliant balloon 315 placed in the LED and the 215 placed in the first diagonal branch in order to better open the struts of the stand towards the first diagonal branch. And then of course, we, um, we finish with the final pot with the no compliant balloon 312. Also in this case, we used the stent beads in order to uh, place properly the balloon. And you can see from the stent beads how the uh, struts of the stent towards the first diagonal branch are, um, are open, are well open. Then we inflated the balloon up to 18 atmosphere for the final pot. So basically we performed the pot kiss pot strategy. And here you can also see again the res final result with the stand bits. And here we see clearly the, the struts of the stand in the diagonal branch. So thank you. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Manuele, for the case. Now I'm curious to know uh, with my colleague in Italy, what are your attitude to do post PCIFFR? Simone, please. Yes, I must be very, very honest. In this case, maybe I would have done uh, on the LAD, but surely not on the diagonal branch. Because, I mean, it would have been not so easy to cross with the FFR wire in the diagonal. And so I think this is the way I would have managed it. Thank you. Luigi? Yes, I have to say the same uh, as uh, Simone already uh, told us. Uh, probably I would have measured just the LED uh, and uh, I would have performed the pullback uh, in order to see uh, what is the impact of the stent of the entire functional assessment of the, of, of the vessel. And I would have, I would have never um, measured the diagonal branch uh, after, the, after the kissing and after the pot. Thank you, thank you, Luigi. So let's move to, to have some question for Emanuele. Simone, can you jump in? Yes, absolutely. What uh, it surprises me is, uh, I mean, uh, how feasible the system is. So if I think to do the same with the, with the conventional pressure wire, I have to deconnect and reconnect and uh, clean with the goes and then uh, remove the contrast from the bottom part of the wire. And then the connection is not uh, always <laughs> working and, and I lose a uh, time contrast X-ray. So uh, what is your feeling about this difference in, in this case and in your experience with the system? Uh, indeed, uh, Simone, this system uh, introduces a significant degree of uh, simplification in our invasive functional assessment. And simplification goes exactly for the steps you just highlighted. The simple fact that you don't have to uh, uh, connect and disconnect in case you would use the pressure wire also to perform PCI, but some other operators might also 
uh, uh, inquire by saying, you know, I use pressure wire only to assess and not to treat, depending on the complexity of the, of the lesion, um, that is already a major step forward. So the, the microcatheter is always connected to the console. So all you have to do is to keep it clean on the table and introducing it back the time you need it. And that, of course, um, uh, contributes to the quality of the signal and to the lack of final drift that was alluded by Luigi before. Thank you, Manuele. Very clear. Uh, Luigi, do you have any comment? Yes. Uh, um, well, the way you, uh, Emanuele, perform the, the crisscross uh, of the wires uh, is, uh, is impressive. And probably if you would have used uh, uh, a pressure wire for the PCI or the, or the main branch, uh, you probably would uh, have never crossed the, the stent struts through the diagonal branch. And you probably would have asked for a third wire. So, uh, this system probably allow us to spare not only contrast and uh, uh, time, but even material. That's, uh, that's uh, very well said, uh, Luigi. We know the quality of the pressure wire has improved. Nowadays, they are really um, slippery, they are hydrophilic, uh, and they can easily be handled, but it's never the same quality of a workers guide wire. This we know it very well. I would never dare for example, to jail a pressure wire uh, behind the stent struts, especially if you are in a calcified lesion setting. You never know. These are two separate body of the wire, of the technology, so they can easily disconnect. And, and that is what you avoid by using this system. You can forget whatever wire you're using. You can just use your PCI wire and then afterward do your assessment by going in and out with the microcatheter. In addition, Having good quality wire also allows you to be within the vessel without the fear to go subintimally. You know, when a guide wire is not well performing in a, in a side branch that has been uh, treated with kissing balloon, you never know whether there is a little intimal fear in which you can fall if the wire is not freely moving. And this system avoids this potential risk. Thank you, Manuele. I think it's time to see the final part of the case. So please. Yes, Manuel. yes, here we go with the final part. Thank you. So, so we did, um, please, Emanuele. Thank you, Emanuele. We did post PCI evaluation. Huh? Again, microcatheter at the tip of the guiding catheter. We checked the equalization. It's one at this moment. Always consistently, same protocol. We advance the microcatheter up to the landing zone we've given us in the beginning of the uh, physiologic assessment. We, we close the stopcock, we co close the valve of the guiding catheter. We see again, the two pressures are up. This is uh, now the resting uh, PDPA. There we go. We flush the system with saline. We start recording. Few seconds to record the resting PDPA. At a certain point, you will notice that the aortic pressure interrupts. We inject adenosine, there we go. And we get the hyperemic response in the vessel. So this is the first information. FFR post is 0 0.93, so way above ischemic threshold of 0.8. And at this moment, we do the pullback that gives you a second information. How much I can improve this post-PCI FFR? Is there any residual focal gradient that can, I can treat with an additional stent? And what this pullback tells us, we stopped the recording in a short while, what this pullback tells us is that there is diffuse residual disease. So there is no way I can improve this residual grading by additional stenting. And last information, the measurement was correct because the final PDPA was one. Now you see we are going without any problem to a diagonal branch and it took us no time to get into the diagonal branch without any effort. And at this moment, again, we flush the system, we induce hyperemia, we ask our nurse to push on REC. There we go. We are ready. We inject the hyperemic stimulus inside. 
and we wait for the epidemic response. So towards the diagonal branch, the FFR was 0.90. Again, we do the pullback, and we see again this diffuse gradient all the way through with a good equalization at the end. We stop recording. And what you saw again, it's this artifactual number that I'll explain you in a while how to correct it. Final uh, angiographic uh, acquisition here. I would say good angiographic result, good functional result, 0.93 in the LAD, 0.9 something in the diagonal branch. We have finished. Now it comes a very important moment, data chiming. Eh? This was one of these artifactual measurement. Why? Because the system takes the measurement where the simple volume is located. So all what you have to do is to place the simple volume at the stable hyperemic response, push on the FFR, recalculate, relocate the FFR, and that, gi that gives you the right value. In addition, if you want to revisit the measurement, Later on, days after, you need to recall what you did. So tell the system whether you measure the LAD, the circumflex, the marginal branch. So there is some legends in the system. Tell the system whether it was pre-PCI, post-PCI, whether you used adenosine, papaverine, because this information will be useful later on. And at the end, you can review all your measurements, four, five, six measurements. You see how many we did. And each of them did not last more than one minute. So we did a multivessel disease functional assessment. I think we can stop sharing the screen. Um, we did a multivessel disease functional assessment without any uh, um, uh, further waste of time. In total, one minute each. So in five, six minutes, you have pre and post PCI assessment and evaluation. Thank you, Manuel. Really impressive. Impressive about the time that you see on the screen and how much is user friendly this device. I give the words to my colleague. Luigi, do you have any question for Emanuele? Yes, uh, thank you, Eugenio. Um, well, I, I noticed that the, 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 the passage of uh, the true physio microcutter was extremely smooth across, even across uh, the diagonal branch after kissing and, uh, and uh, the pot. Um, do you, can you give us some feedback about this uh, um, peculiarity and uh, in addition, what do you think uh, the potential role, what about uh, the potential role of this microcatheter for the assessment of coronary bifurcation, especially for the left main where uh, the new mantra seems to be uh, the DK crash? You know, um... Left main is a different kind of bifurcation eh? um, um, where you would like to achieve a nearly perfect result. But that is a kind of, that is a kind of uh, assessment that I would do uh, honestly with intravascular imaging in left main rather than functional assessment. Nevertheless, if we are talking about standing technique, cr crushing technique or mini crush implies different layer of metal that are pushed on one side of the vessel, as we know. And these layers of metal are not always easy to cross and recross, especially if we want to do final kissing balloon. But nevertheless, it is extremely important to assess the final functional result. Why? Because if we decide to do mini crush technique, you have certainly few millimeters of the side branch that are diseased as well. So it's not like in this specific case that we just showed, that we opened the stent struts towards the side branch, but there was not much of disease in the side branch itself. But when it comes to true bifurcation lesion, where both the main branch and the side branch are diseased, having a technique that enab enables you easily to go in and out the main branch and in and out the side branch to assess the final stenting result from a functional point of view is certainly an added value. Thank you, thank you, Emanuele. Uh, Simone, do you have any question for Emanuele? Yeah, so basically this was uh, almost a live procedure and it took uh, 20 minutes. So, and you perform, uh, if I'm not wrong, five uh, uh, functional assessments. So I think that uh, this is quite astonishing for me to perform such uh, a good functional evaluation in, uh, in a short time. I don't know if you can comment a little bit on this. Simone, that is actually what a, a novel technology should do, should make things simpler and should also make them quicker. Just guess for a minute if we would have done this procedure with a pressure wire. Can you imagine to cross and recross a standard segment? 
You know how many times it's difficult because the tip of the guide wire hits against the stand struts. So we have to pull it back, talk a bit, advance, hoping that we would not enter the vessel wall because this occurred as well. So we, we did this, not only in the main branch, that was rather a straight uh, segment, but we did this also into the side branch with really no extra time and no extra effort. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Manuel. Uh, can I ask you, you know that uh, our job is to restore the epicardial uh, um, function, no? uh, conductance of the, the vessel. Uh, you did FFR pullback, but now uh, how, do you, how do you say that uh, uh, the FFR that you achieve is correct? Well, I don't want to pre-empty the, the nice lecture that Simone is going to give after this bit of the session, but you know, the higher the post-PCI FFR value, the better. Huh? That's the, it's a paradigm, but it's not always achievable. I think what, import, what is important is to check whether we can further improve uh, post-PCI functional result, how? Checking whether there is any intrastent residual gradient, and Simona will tell about this, and checking whether there is any focal residual gradient beyond the stents or uh, upstream to the stent that I can further improve it by implanting additional stent. Having said that, we have to be uh, very practical um, try to improve what can be improved, but always keeping in mind that the longer the standard segment, the worse the clinical outcome for the, pre for the patient. So we should also try to avoid to have a full metal jacket at the end of the procedure. There has to be common sense. Thank you, very clear. Uh, Luigi, do you have any last question for Emanuele? Yes, not because I'm addicted to the side branches, but uh, um, actually I just want to, um, to know, uh, in case you measure the side branch, uh, which, which value would you like to, uh, to reach? Or do you rather prefer to take care about the angiographic result and that's it? You know, um, let's again be, be very practical and I don't have uh, clinical data to support this statement. Uh, but what I'd like to see from a functional result in a side branch is that the FFR value would not be lower than the FFR value that I measure post-PCI in the main branch. Because if that is the case, we are in trouble. Let's not forget that the side branch has upstream the main vessel. So what I expect a post-PCI FFR in a side branch is to tell me the impact of the atherosclerotic burden that is upstream to the side branch in the final FFR measurement. If that is the case, I'm happy with that. Thank you, thank you, Manuel. <clears throat> I think it's time. Please, please, Manuel. Thank you very much. I think it's time now to introduce the last uh, lecture of our session. Um, so uh, without further delay, I'd like to uh, give wor the word to Simone, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Emanuele. So basically, what we have to deal with in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes is uh, how a microcatheter-based FFR can help us in uh, planning, optimizing PCI, and also in assessing functional results, as we have uh, just seen in the beautiful case presented by Emanuele. So these are my conflicts of interest. And I, I will try to, uh, you know, to touch two main issues. The, the first one is uh, if with a, a FFR, we can actually understand uh, not only if uh, a vessel has to be treated or not, but also uh, which is the underlying mechanism of the disease. So if we are in front of a focal disease or a diffuse disease or a combination of uh, both uh, type of disease. And this is very important because it can help us in uh, both indication to the procedure and in planning it. And the second point will be about post-PCI assessment. So with the, how can we manage to understand uh, if we are facing focal or diffuse disease with FFR? Actually, we have to use the pullback, as uh, Emanuele showed, shown just uh, a couple of minutes uh, ago. So if you have uh, a clear Cut, uh, a clear cut in, uh, in a with a big drop, as you can see in the left panel, obviously you're in front of a focal disease. If you have a, 
not uh, clearly one drop, but uh, just a, a regular core with the same angulation in all during the pullback, you're in front of diffuse disease. And this, I think, is the, the first very important message about uh, uh, FFR pullback. The second uh, message is, is it possible to quantify focal versus diffuse disease? Because yes, you can do it, but probably in uh, real practice, you can be in trouble sometimes in understanding whether the disease you're facing is focal or diffuse. And uh, the answer is yes, we are starting to do it. This is uh, uh, the PPG, which is uh, uh, exactly a quantitative measurement of focal versus diffuse disease and briefly what PPG index tells you is that if it's close to one you are in front of a clearly focal disease as you can see in the left panel where you have a beautiful focal lesion with a, a clear drop in the FFR pullback while on the other panel so the, the right one you see that the PPG is much closer to zero than uh, to one, it, which is a 0 0.48. So you are in front of a diffuse disease. So it's unlikely that with the PCI, you will uh, improve, uh, uh, improve the functional um, results of in this patient uh, uh, as you would do in, with the focal disease. Another interesting study uh, that has been uh, published uh, recently is uh, the, uh, the validation of the automated algorithm of instantaneous fractional flow reserve gradient per unit of time, which is uh, similar. And so if you have a major FFR gradient, which is uh, uh, in the study more than 0 0.035, then you are in front of a focal disease. Uh, otherwise, if you have uh, a, a small gradient, so uh, less than 0 0.015, you are in front of a minor FFR gradient, which is unlikely to be improved by PCI. And this system was validated both with automatic, but also with the manual non-systematic pullback. So probably it will be helpful in, uh, in the future. And as uh, in this case, you see, you see the angel and how you define this, this uh, vessel. Is it focal? Is it diffuse? Is the, are these uh, serial lesions? I don't know, we can discuss about it, but if you perform this kind of uh, objective evaluation, so both uh, FFR pullback and this uh, automatic algorithm, what you see is actually that you have a focal disease in the proximal portion, the, which is not the, the one maybe that is more obvious with the angiography. So, and what they found in this study is that if you have a major gradient, your, sub your uh, physiological result would be better. If you have a minor gradient, uh, your physiological result after PCI would be worse. So once we, we have uh, some kind understood the difference between, between focal and diffuse disease, I think that we should discuss the post-PCI assessment with the FFR and with uh, functional uh, tools uh, in our practice. So I will start uh, with, the, with the case that occurred us in Ferrara uh, last month. So basically this is a 77 year old male with a non STEMI uh, who received a PCI on uh, culprit lesion, which was the LAD. And then uh, it was uh, randomized in the fire trial uh, to complete the vascularization. And so we, as uh, I told you before, we already performed the uh, QFR procedure in the uh, primary PCI and the Yanjo based FFR was positive. So we perform a stage procedure uh, three or four days after the, the acute event. And then you can see a beautiful lesion in the distal RCA. And uh, what we did was to, to implant a stent and then we did our final angio and uh, okay we are done the procedure is finished and the patient uh, uh, comes back to the cardiology ward uh, in i mean in most of uh, my procedures at, uh, at least but uh, what we did in this case was to perform a post pci functional assessment in this case with the rfr and not only that but also a pullback and what you see from the right panel, so from the functional assessment, is that you have a clear drop in the RFR in the distal portion of the vessel. But this is not apparent with the angiography. 
So what we did was to perform a clear stent evaluation of the stent uh, implanted in the distal RCA. And as you can see from the black arrow, you have a clear under expansion of the stent, which is, was not obvious with angiography. And it would have been easy, at least for me, to miss it without functional assessment. So, and this was exactly in the place where we had the, the pullback with the functional assessment. So what we did was actually to better postulate the, the stent and to perform a real final angio, and again, to perform final functional assessment. What we achieved was a good functional result with a uh, RFR near to one with a good uh, increase in FFR 0.09 and with the final FFR similar to the one obtained by Emanuele in this case, so 0.93, which is actually good without uh, uh, any other uh, drop uh, in the pullback. So I think uh, I can have made my case about uh, the, the, the importance of post PCI FFR but, uh, or functional assessment. But uh, what I have to acknowledge is that sometimes we know with functional assessment post PCI that something is wrong, but we don't know what to do with it. And there can be uh, several reasons for a suboptimal physiological result. And I think that the most important thing is to understand uh, which is uh, the reason underlying uh, suboptimal uh, functional uh, results. So there can be stent related issues, uh, which can be related to under expansion, edge, edge dissection and so on. There can be an angiographic unnoticed, unnoticed lesion, especially in case of serial lesion. It can be diffuse disease. You can have also, especially with the Pre normal pressure wire, coronary spasm, altered vasomotor tone despite nitro or pseudostenosis. So basically what you do with the pullback is try to understand which is the underlying mechanism. These are beautiful example kindly given to me by Damien Collison, the PI of the target FFR trial. And basically you see that uh, in, in you can see that I put the stent in the stented seg segment and in the uh, upper case, what you have is a, an instant gradient of 0.10, and then you have a clear distal lesion with a pressure drop, which is uh, uh, around 0.05. So basically, you have a combination of uh, uh, fact about uh, underlying the suboptimal uh, FFR result in this case. So, so what you probably should do is to post dilate the stent and then decide whether to add another stent, uh, small, uh, short stent distally. Uh, I, on the bottom part of the slide, you can see a case of diffuse disease because what you have is, the, is a, a, a constant gradient across the vessel. So you have a distal gradient of 0.06 and then you have a, uh, an instant gradient of 0.06 and then you have a proximal gradient of 0.06. So yes, you can probably post dilate the stent, but I don't think that you will achieve much of a good result uh, uh, going uh, with uh, another stand proximally and distally because the, the, the disease of the patient in this case is uh, much more diffuse than focal. So uh, I don't know if this is a patient in which we can achieve a, a good result. Another interesting aspect, and I think that this can, we can discuss uh, afterward with uh, how uh, microcatheter, microcatheter can be helpful in this case, is that uh, these are two measurements of the same patient, one before PCI and the other after PCI. So basically what you see in the before PCI assessment, you see two drops, one proximal and one distal. And what the operator decided to do was to stent the proximal one and then to perform again uh, FFR after PCI. And then you see a new focal drop, which was uh, in correspondence with the second one we have seen in the first uh, measurement, uh, which is uh, much higher than before. And this can happen with FFR, but imagine how easy it is to tackle this with the microcatheter rather than with the, the pressure wire. And uh, I think that this is the last point uh, uh, I want to touch with uh, my presentation, but I think this is the most important one, which is if we want to apply physiology to plan, to optimize and uh, to assess uh, the results uh, of our PCI, we have to do on uh, 
we have to do in all the cases because it, it's much a matter of uh, applying it systematically uh, that enables yeah. us to understand uh, to to understand the mechanism and uh, to apply the proper measurement this is what the, was done in this uh, beautiful study by agarwal and they what they found is that uh, they found ischemic range in 20 percent of the cases and this is what happens in all the studies about post ffr assessment and that they were able to to do something in 96% of the cases. Again, this is a, a beautiful study by uh, our friend Barry Retsky. And what they found is that they tried to use pressure wire as a workhorse wire, but as we already said, it's not a workhorse wire, but they were able to do it and uh, to perform a functional guided procedure from the beginning to the very end in 92% of the cases. But again, uh, what they did was to apply it in all cases, all day, every day, every case. And this enables you uh, with experience and so on to achieve a good results. Uh, what was done actually in the target FFR trial, and then what you see is that if you are able to optimize uh, your uh, your procedure with FFR, actually the percentage of patients with an ischemic FFR after your procedures is significantly reduced. And again, you see one out of three patients comes uh, come out of our lab, uh, cat lab with uh, an ischemic FFR after our procedure. And I think this is something we, we have to deal with uh, if we want to do a good job. So I think that I can uh, uh, sum up my slides in this one. So I think that physiology should become uh, uh, our final angiographic projection in 2021. But what we have to deal with is, uh, is it possible or not to, to do it? Because it's always beautiful to say it, to you know, show beautiful cases in, um, in gym and in other congresses, but it's possible when uh, I do my cases in the cat lab. And so I think that this is actually where the microcatheter can help us. Because uh, as we all know, to perform an FFR during and after PCI comes at a price. That is, as we said, duration of the procedure, contrast dose, fluoroscopy, adenosine dosage, adenosine duration, and so on. So actually, we have some barriers uh, uh, explaining the, the, the low use of FFR post PCI, and they are both cultural and practical. The cultural ones are randomized clinical trials, are not conclusive uh, to this regard. And we have not clear cut instruction in terms of number of cutoffs on what to do. At the same time, I think that the most important barrier is practical. And as we already said, is uh, related to adenosine uh, administration, to the, wire, to the impossibility to maintain wire position during pullback, to the fact that uh, interpreting a manual FFR pullback once uh, per month can be difficult, uh, and uh, also that uh, you have to face that you are not always able to achieve uh, the, the results you had in mind in the first place. And uh, what I think is that really a microcatheter-based physiology can help us. First, because uh, I think that randomized clinical trials are not conclusive also because it's not so easy to do them with, uh, with conventional uh, physiology tools, where, whereas with uh, a really, really practical uh, physiology tool as a macrocatheter, it could be uh, possible to have uh, clinical data in complex settings. Again, you have a real... Uh, almost 100% feasibility with this wire, where, whereas with the FFR or QFR and so on, especially in complex cases, you are not able to perform the analysis in 20 or 30% of the cases. There's no need of contrast, of more contrast, X-ray, additional time. And then you have your wiring position, you are in a safe setting, and probably as a Emanuele already said, I think that it, can, it could be interesting also to, you know, to perform a combo between uh, Pavarin and a microcatheter. So I think it can be really, it can really help us also in post-PCI assessment. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Simone. Very well done. Uh, let me open the discussion on this um, presentation, uh, asking whether there are questions. Uh, also from yeah. your side, Emanuele, do you have questions? Yes. Uh, yes, I have a question. First, thank you for your presentation, Simone. And um, my question is, so we understood that with the FFR pullback, we are 
um, able to uh, to different to, to see in which case we have a focal disease and when we have a diffuse disease. But now my question is, when you have a patient with an FFR less than 0.8 with a diffuse disease, how do you behave? How uh, do you decide whether to uh, address this patient to revascularization, uh, either medical, uh, either cutaneously or surgical, or to medical therapy? Yeah, that's one million dollar question, actually. <laughs> so basically what I do in my practice is that obviously if the patient has, uh, uh, can be you know, uh, referred to surgery because of uh, the, the, the type of lesion he has or she has, the presence of diabetes and so on, yes, surgery can be an option, but actually you have no data about it. So I don't know if it's better than PCI. What I do in my real clinical practice is try to address the proximal portion of the vessel and then if you have a diffuse disease in the distal portion of the vessel there's there's no much you can do about it so i try to avoid uh, uh, as uh, emanuele said before a full metal jacket but probably i try to ask to to address the at least the proximal issue Very thank good. you uh, thank you emanuele any other question Eugenio, before we close this session Thank you. If possible, I would like to ask to Simone. We understood that the post PCI FFR fullback is part, has to be part of our functional assessment as final control angio. But practically, how do you perform fullback in your cath lab? And when you consider a focal pressure drop uh, in the stent worthy of PCI optimization? Yeah, another very good question. So basically what we do, we perform manual pullback. We try to, to achieve uh, a standardized, let's say, speed. So five, six uh, millimeters per second so that we can, and we use bookmarks. So basically when you are in the place you think you, you see the lesion is, you place a bookmark so that it's easier than to, to understand what's happening. And as uh, for... Uh, uh, the numbers, uh, I don't know. I mean, there are no uh, validated thresholds. What we do is that uh, what actually was done in the target FFR trial. So if you have a drop uh, more than 0 0.05, maybe you can uh, think of doing uh, something about it. Otherwise, you can leave it like that. But uh, there's no uh, randomized clinical database in uh, my practice, actually. Thank you again. Uh... Uh, Simone, let me just check uh, with Luigi whether he has any final remaining question before we close this interesting uh, symposium. Luigi, are you happy? Do you have any final comment? No, Emanuele, I'm uh, really happy with this, uh, these presentations and this nice case example. Uh, it's, uh, it was, a, I think, a very nice session, a clear session, and it allows us to understand uh, not only the uh, the, 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 the importance of the, to have, have the right tool for the right disease, but uh, it also uh, turn on the lights on uh, new, uh, new perspectives for, uh, for research and for, uh, in order to, to achieve the best uh, optimal medical, optimal treatment for our patients. Thank you. I think with, uh, with your words, Luigi, we are ready to uh, close this uh, session and I will uh, um, share just a few slides that uh, summarize what we uh, just discussed and a few points of consensus uh, on our session on contemporary adoption of invasive coronary physiology with microcatheter-based technology. These are the consensus points I feel we reached during this, uh, um, this session that management of patients with coronary artery disease based on coronary physiology assessment improves clinical outcome. We have now plenty of data supporting this statement as highlighted by both uh, Luigi and Simone. Invasive functional assessment remains the most accurate asset available to interventional cardiologists. We we'll learned from uh, Simone that even with novel modalities like uh, uh, QFR, for example, there is some uh, issue in terms of feasibility in 100% of patients because there are some settings where we still have problems to, to do that. And with non-invasive technique, we know that diagnostic accuracy is not 100%. It's not the ones we achieve with invasive functional assessment. 
And finally, systematic widespread adoption advocates robust simplification in the tools and techniques that we use. That is a must if we want that this uh, technique is applied every day in our car clubs and in every setting. So uh, there should be no uh, uh, reason not to do it anymore. And these are my conclusions. Uh, Microcatheter based current physiology simplifies invasive functional assessment, even in the most challenging angiographic setting and post PCI. And it might further improve adoption, both to indicate and guide percutaneous uh, revascularization. Um, with this, I think I stop sharing my screen. I'd like to thank everyone to uh, have followed this session. I hope you enjoyed as much as we did uh, during this hour uh, or so. I would like to thank my colleagues, uh, uh, Eugenio, my co-chairman, Luigi, Simone, and Emanuele, uh, speakers and, and uh, co-operators during the case, the team in house, and of course, a special thank to our sponsor who, who made this session possible. Again, Inside Life Tech and Yukon. Thank you very much. A good continuation of the gym meeting. Thank you. To transform healthcare through innovation and quality.